afternoon, everyone. Thank you for uh, joining us here for uh, the OSU Public Health Seminar Series. Uh, we'll be starting um, for this semester a monthly uh, program uh, related to it. And next month, we'll have Dr. Kelly Rhodes, who is from who is from here at Oklahoma State University, and we'll be presenting on her work related to uh, consent, uh, sexual assault, and partner intimate partner violence and the like. Um, thank you all for taking time out of your schedule for those who are here in person, but then for those who are joining us via Zoom. Uh, my name is Randy Kubok. I'm an associate professor here at Oklahoma State University on the medical campus at the Center for Health Sciences. Um, and today I kind of want to speak to some of our work that we're doing uh, related to ending the HIV epidemic, especially within rural communities, um, but also President Trump's uh, call for action related to ending the epidemic within the United States and the like. So within this, to kind of just start off um, as well, I think we have to have a conversation looking at apologies, technology. So within this, we'll look at kind of the scope of the problem. Um, also, looking at uh, the Trump administration's end of the epidemic the plan for America, uh, syndemic thinking, especially applying syndemic theory thinking uh, when looking at rural HIV, and what are some of these intervention opportunities uh, that we can apply within these communities from the forefront. And so, the question that many people ask, especially for those that are joining us via Zoom, is why focus on Oklahoma, um, but what is rural? And so, part of this is making this case for Oklahoma as a context to, to apply new methodologies and modalities within rural communities. Um, and so the main reason is I'm here. Um, <laughs> as a rural HIV researcher, it provides a per, uh, great context within that. But in reality, Oklahoma provides that perfect context for really testing strategies regarding the rural HIV care continuum. Uh, our state has similar urban rural uh, proportions to five other states within the United States, um, but we also are more urban than 15 other states for those in Oklahoma. Um, it might feel a little hard to believe that there's 15 other more rural states than us. Uh, we, within these kind of similar cultural contact states and similar populations, it counts about 20% uh, of the US population. And so if we think about developing programs that could be generalizable and then rolled out to other communities within the United States, uh, we can use Oklahoma as a, as a uh, kind of a test uh, to see how this might work with other states within a similar cultural context, especially if we start to look at places like Arkansas, Missouri, Kansas, Iowa, and the like. Um, Oklahoma is also unique because of our geographic location. Um, traditionally, we're lumped with the southern jurisdiction in the U.S., but we're not really southern in a way. Um, the southern portion of our state feels more southern within the southern east, southeast area, uh, but more of that uh, northeast feels much more Midwestern, whereas the western part of the state starts to adapt some of those cultural contexts uh, from like New Mexico and then also in Colorado. And so given kind of this location, we really um, do kind of belong with that cultural context of the Midwest. But as we also try to roll out larger public health programming with our state, uh, we have the unique opportunity then to engage tribal communities uh, within this work who already might have that large public health infrastructure to address some of these concerns. One of these would be Cherokee Nation, who's already working on their uh, Hep C eradication uh, program. So any uh, tribal member who comes in contact with tribal services is screened for hepatitis C. Um, and now that any person, a tribal member that's medically eligible uh, will then receive treatment for Hep C. And working with them with those partners then uh, for HIV programming and getting screened and the like. And so how can we take some of these robust public health programs within these tribal nations and apply them to smaller nations within our state? And so as we see here though, uh, the predominant area of Oklahoma is tribal land with your larger tribes like the Cherokee, the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Chickasaw. Um, but how can we then take some of these programs that have been shown to be efficacious and then roll it out to smaller tribes or those, those uh, tribal partnerships? And so we then have to have a basic work, uh, working definition of rural. And when we think about what is rural and what is urban, um, those definitions look quite different. And there's a debate. So if you're using 
USDA metrics versus RUCA versus the index of relative reality, that there are 12 or 13 different definitions that we could use to say what is rural, what is not rural. And so these have different shortcomings. Most of them are based on a county uh, level. Um, and those for who are Oklahoma based, if we can think of a place like Payne County, we're designated more also uh, metropolitan or urban because of we have this quote unquote urban sphere within Stillwater. Uh, but when you go out three miles outside the city, we tend to have that more rural mindset. And so there's a lot of communities that we have and we work with that might have uh, one community that's changing the designation uh, and they might not be classified as rural when they should. And so had, instead of having this dichotomy of uh, is it rural, is it urban, we really be <coughs> looking at uh, this question of how rural is it. So rurality more of a continuum. So looking not at our traditional aspects of what is the population density, what are the resources available, what's the nearest big city, so the kind of rural urban community um, aspects, but what is that cultural context within there? Um, but we should focus then more on a zip code level, understanding that county jurisdictions are kind of antiquated in the way that within a large county, you can quickly have uh, variations that change. Uh, we see that, of course, here within Payne County and Stillwater, but those who are familiar with the University of Oklahoma down in Norman, uh, within that county, uh, we have great variations between the city of Norman, where the university's at, and the northern side that butts up to Oklahoma City to when you go more south, uh, it creates uh, um, is definitely much more of that rural kind of atmosphere. And so one thing that my research group is using metrics like the index relative reality, uh, which is from Waldo and colleagues at Purdue University, uh, which is still county level, but starts to look at what are some of these different characteristics that come into play. Um, and so reality is then measured on a gradation from zero to one, zero being um, essentially metropolitan to where uh, one is completely rural. Uh, most areas within Oklahoma range from about a 0.4 to about a 0.6. And a lot of this also tells us that extreme rurality is absent from most areas. So when we think about the deep rural South or the rural New England, that these areas traditionally are within commuting distances from larger metropolitan centers. Um, so sometimes they're missed by some of these categorizations, where if we think about extreme reality, which would be more Montana, Alaska, Wyoming, to where you're still not even with the community distance to a large city, um, creates different issues. And so as we look at kind of this focus on HIV, uh, I mean, we have to understand what is the scope of the problem within our state. And those familiar with AIDS view run out of Emory University, uh, looking at kind of our most recent data, that's the program from 2016, uh, we start to see some various gradations of uh, what the epidemic looks like within our state. Uh, traditionally, we, we think of these larger metropolitan centers around the Oklahoma City area, the Tulsa area, uh, but we also see increased burden within other counties um, that tend to be uh, really kind of um, listed as relatively rural. Those can be out within the Panhandle, uh, which is the Guyman area. Uh, where we have a larger Margaret farm worker with uh, more pig farms and the like. Whereas and also in the northeastern state, part of the state, you have much more farm and poultry uh, going on there. But also we see other hot spots within the state that border Texas in that area um, where we, we see also increased uh, uh, intravenous drug use and the like. And so the HIV epidemic uh, within the state of Oklahoma Oklahoma, even though there's been lots of work uh, that our, our state health department and county health departments have done, we have room for growth within it. And so this becomes essential when we start to think about what um, is happening at a national level. So within Oklahoma and within from really the US, that this came out in MMWR um, just about a month ago, looking at um, national HIV testing within the United States. And from within that report, we start to identify 50 local jurisdictions uh, that account for the majority of new HIV diagnoses. And that within that, seven states were disproportionately affected or imp uh, impacted within rural communities. So this was a push to look at how can we focus on certain jurisdictions and states to really start to make a difference within the epidemic. 
And so this report really was based on Burfus data. Um, so looking at uh, behavior risk um, surveillance to where they wanted to look at what was HIV testing patterns look like for adults within the United States. And so within the seven uh, states that are identified for having a high burden of rural HIV, uh, we start to then look at what does the HIV testing rates look like. Um, and so for those living in Oklahoma, it's no shocker. Uh, we have the lowest HIV testing rates of those seven states. Um, so when we look at um, within the sample of about 12,000 people split between urban and rural communities, about 30% of individuals had ever been tested for HIV in their lifetime. And with those who've been tested in the last year, it's just about 7%. And when we look at that comparable to other, the other seven states, uh, the lowest is about 33.7, is about so about three to four percent off of other states within that. And so this data then is extrapolated to say, well, if we have low HIV testing done within our state, less individuals who are aware of their status, we're not capturing individuals that might be living with HIV and yet unaware. And so this contributes to the spread of HIV in our communities um, and not able to potentially lower community viral load based on individuals who don't know their status. And so we then can then over intersect that looking at well, if individuals are not getting screened, well, how does that burden our larger HIV care continuum? And so what we know of that is that the care continuum um, is really unreliable in rural areas of the United States. And this is when you start to think about HIV screening, getting people linked to HIV care. Um, so we really want to get people who are diagnosed, linked to care, then put on an antiretroviral, and then have achieved viral load submission. But that whole care continuum is uh, premised on the idea that people have to be aware of their status in order to either link them to prevention opportunities or link them into care. And what we see now is the nature of the HIV epidemic really has changed within the last decade, where social um, and structural factors are coalescing together and putting people at risk. So things like social economic status, cultural context, geography have moved the HIV epidemic to places um, where Individuals are dispersed and our public health resources that tend to be limited. And so when we see that, you know, we set up this problem about what's going on in Oklahoma, we have um, definitely the burden of HIV cases. We have underdeveloped uh, care systems, especially within rural areas. We then start to look up what other issues might be contributed in. And so my team really starts to work and look at uh, sexual minority individuals uh, within these, these spheres and what could then lead to uh, a better care system. So with collaborators, uh, we looked at pre-exposure prophylaxis. Uh, so pre PrEP is a once a day medication that individuals can take uh, for the prevention of HIV transmission, has high efficacy, um, is widely adopted as best practices. Unfortunately, we've had um, lower uptake within Oklahoma and other similar states. Uh, that a lot of higher uptake tends to uh, be within metropolitan, metropolitan spheres and other areas um, on the coast. And so looking at what prevents that engagement and uptake, we recruited 40 um, MSM living within the state. And we saw that there were really kind of breakdowns in this prep continuum and that there was low uptake, especially among rural populations. And this could be because they're ge ge geographically isolated so are there, there are fewer providers who are aware or willing to prescribe PrEP, um, and they might not have LGBT, be able to engage LGBT um, sensitive medical care. So for example, um, thinking about back to the map of Oklahoma, we interviewed, interviewed individuals that were in the Pandal area of Guyman who drive up to Denver to get a prescription. We had people that were down in Paul's Valley, which is the southern part of the state, they're going down to Dallas. And when we interview within other studies of the providers, uh, even those who might be doing infectious disease medicine thought PrEP was outside their scope of practice and kind of took a moralistic understanding uh, to prescribing it almost equated to birth control, that if I prescribe PrEP, I'm endorsing them to engage in a potential risk behavior. So even though we have that efficacy that shows that it does prevent HIV, um, it's still predicated on the fact that people have to be willing to prescribe it. 
So we have limited access also within these areas to HIV and STI screening, and that there is a stigma that's associated with it, uh, both within, within group bias, which is even more problematic that when you're already socially uh, ostracized and isolated as a, a sexual minority man, um, that within that group, the LGBT community, um, you could be then uh, stigmatized for being at risk for HIV or being on PrEP. Uh, but there's also structural uh, type of stigmas that we see within Oklahoma and other states uh, where policy um, may create more burdens for individuals. And so we also then look at um, the fact that in order to get people screened, even for HIV, other STIs and PrEP, uh, they have to disclose to their medical provider. And so if we're thinking about general primary care, that we wanted to understand why individuals may not be telling their providers either about their sexual behavior or their sexual orientation. And so uh, with my former doc student at Texas Tech, Joe Kern, we wanted to kind of predict what influences men with sex with men to inform providers about their sexual behavior um, or their sexual orientation. One of them was age, and so that the younger that we are, the more likely we're, we're willing to disclose. And part of that is cultural norms and shifts that occurred within the last uh, two decades where individuals feel more comfortable or feel like as a society we're more informing. informing. Also, we are trying to look at their uh, level of disclosure. And essentially, uh, this boiled down to that if you were not out in other settings, you are not going to also tell your medical provider. Um, and so what we see within these communities, especially with a socially conservative state, that people are not necessarily um, identifying with the LGBT community. They might be men of sex with men, but they don't identify as gay or bisexual. Uh, but they also might not be disclosing to friends or any other social uh, network. What was interesting, though, is that when we look at the difference between disclosing to a medical provider versus a mental health provider, over 90% were willing to just have these discussions with their therapist or their mental health provider, but less than 50% were disclosed to their medical provider. And a lot of that had to do with feared rejection um, from those providers. Uh, but when we go qualitatively looking into that, uh, individuals talk about that at its core, mental health counseling is about building that trust relationship and having time together. So there's feelings of trust because usually identity um, and cultural norms are part of the therapy process addressing that. Whereas within the physician, if you're lucky to have 10 or 15 minutes with an individual, usually your presenting health issue are not related to your sexuality. So if you have a sore throat, uh, you're having abdomen issues, anything like that, usually it's not tied to your social, social behavior, social orientation. So combined with that fear of rejection, we tend to leave that out from disclosing, but then we miss opportunities to have additional screening uh, for clients who might present at higher risk. We also then look at uh, the role of stigma, and then we know that how stigma um, relates to negative health outcomes. If anything, it drives behavior underground. Uh, to where we don't have these conversations. And that there, in another study, we've been very able to look at how this relates to um, mental health, especially depressive symptomatology and how it's related to loneliness. And so earlier work has looked how the more lonely we are, the, the more likely we're to engage in potential risk behaviors in order as kind of a maladaptive coping mechanism. That if we feel socially or emotionally lonely, we might engage in dating or sexual behaviors that are high risk in this, this idea that if I do, this person will likely, will likely more and maybe will date. Um, we've also then started to look at, well, how does substance use start to come into play? Um, and findings kind of show that individuals do have these kind of expectations or um, related to substance use and how that influences the sexual experience but also how that influences their risk. Uh, but the biggest thing, I think, it's also starting to look at how individuals feel like they can um, receive health education programming. So traditionally from a public health model, we really are about community building, community development, especially about among the marginalized groups. And so a lot of our interventions around HIV have been about how do we get this sense of community built for gay bisexual men so that they can provide social support to each other 
The problem within rural communities, these individuals, they might not identify as gay or bisexual, even though they're having sex with men, um, but they're not really wanting to engage in a large community kind of development because of the fact they could out them uh, too. So traditional models uh, might not work within some of these settings. I mean, the way that we recruit individuals look different. And so within interviews, you know, having things that in our messaging that, you know, uses things like the rainbow or directly talks about gay and bisexual men, that these are tend to be frowned upon uh, because these are things that potentially out you, but they're not something they actually um, identify with. And at its core, you know, if we're thinking about problems around sexuality and sexual health, um, it starts off with sexuality education. And so within here, we had a, a large, robust uh, kind of interviews with individuals about how um, sex education within our state and other socially conservative states tend to be lacking. And then within that, it's especially lacking to be responsive to the needs of sexual and gender minority individuals. So we see the scope of the issues within our state. And now within the last year, the administration with the CDC and the like really have started to advocate for how we can address the HIV epidemic, um, almost to the HIV elimination plan. And so as part of that, President Trump during his last day of the union in, in 2019, um, announced this new plan for ending the HIV epidemic, a plan for America, which will be driven um, through the National Institutes, the CDC, SAMHSA, HRSA, and the like. And that the goal is to um, reach the end of the epidemic, hopefully within about 10 years. And it has a multifaceted uh, aspect of it to we can kind of reach this plan. And similar to that earlier article that I brought up earlier from the MMWR, the plan is responsive to these disproportionately burdened uh, communities, both at the state level of the set of seven relatively rural states with a rural burden, uh, but these 50 uh, jurisdictions of so 48 counties, uh, DC and Puerto Rico um, that account for the larger uh, burden within, this, within the nation. And these seven states with a uh, substantial rural burden are have either 70, they have to have at least 75 cases uh, within these communities and 10% of their overall new cases have to be diagnosed uh, within rural areas. So within this, we start to place an emphasis for funding and programming that kind of meet uh, various goals and objectives. And the largest goal here is to go ahead and reduce the number of new infections um, in five years by 75% and that this will lead to a 90% reduction in 10 years. And in order to meet this goal, uh, four different objectives really have been placed. Um, that we have to diagnose all people as early as possible. We have to treat people with HIV rapidly and effectively in order to get sustained viral suppression to bring down our community viral load, engage in more biomedical um, preventative measures through uh, diffusing pre-exposure prophylaxis in our in our state, but also adapting and adopting syringe service syringe service programs uh, within the state too, which leads to some interesting conversations in the state of like Oklahoma, where we really prevent any type of syringe programming uh, too. And then, kind of as um, a nod to what we experienced within Scott County, Indiana back in 2013-2014 when we had that rapidly evolving HIV hepatitis C outbreak that was related to uh, injection drug use, how we then can respond quickly to these different kind of outbreaks uh, within um, from a traditional uh, public health model with other types of medical models um, to go ahead and call that, that outbreak. And so in order to as the first round to start doing this, we, across these various agencies, so NIH, SAMHSA, HRSA, um, and the like, uh, we're putting more funding into these various jurisdictions. And so recently, NIH announced that they had awarded about 111.3 million to uh, 23 institutions across the United States to kind of work with uh, regional and local partners to address the epidemic, for both with diagnosis, treating, by uh, keeping people in care um, and the like. And so a lot of these were funded through 
uh, CFARs uh, within its areas. Um, but when you look at the funding, um, which is on this, this little diagram, and I apologize, um, these are the entities that received funds. Uh, they tend to be in these larger metropolitan with these 48 or 50 jurisdictions, where the only rural state that really uh, was addressed there it was down in Alabama, uh, which is within that community has um, other areas of, of higher need. So we're keeping up this trend where we are prioritizing these relatively rural states, uh, but we're not diverting that funding there. And so this is an initiative that could allow for the implementation of programming that we'll kind of discuss here in just a minute uh, to kind of really uh, get us in gear for the HIV care continuum. But the Planet for America with HIV um, calls for this idea that in order to address HIV, we really have to be looking at hep C, that the two things are so interrelated to each other. And especially here in Oklahoma, when we start to think about hep C within our state, the diagnosis or the estimated rate of hep C uh, within Oklahoma is higher than the southern US and it's higher than the national averages. That time after time, our rates are higher than our peers, uh, which means that we have to address HIV and hep C uh, together as one. We also, our, our deaths that are attributed to hepatitis C um, are higher than Oklahoma than within the southern region and higher than the national average. And when we think of why this might think where we have this synergistic relationship between hepatitis C, hepatitis, and HIV, we can start to look at the role of opioids and other types of substances. And so if we think about uh, overdose, overdose rates with here within our state, overdose rates that are attributed to prescription opioids are declining. Part of this is great policy that we work with physicians um, to limit uh, prescribing, uh, to do further education uh, and a type of interventions. Um, but we also start to increase, see an increase of overdose deaths related to synthetic opioids, but also heroin. And so we then start to look at, well, we have this focus on opioid prescribing, um, and that is, those numbers are coming down, but what happens to individuals when they are no longer able to get those prescription opioids, where are they turning to? And that's where we start to see synthetic opioids, but also heroin. And so this just came out uh, in JAMA recently that was starting a discussion that in order to really address the HIV epidemic and to focus on HIV uh, elimination plans, that we have to look at opioid injection use within rural communities. That by failing to do so, we are not going to be able to reach our goals, uh, but at the same time, we're creating opportunities for new hotspots um, to then come up. And we get these conversations. Uh, so Stephanie Strathy, who's down in San Diego, um, who does a lot of work in injection drug use, um, put out this within the uh, New England Journal of Medicine a couple years back, looking at the Indiana case about what steps we can be taking from a medical perspective, but also from a, a policy perspective to how do we stop these various outbreaks within our communities. And so from a physician side, it starts to be about normalizing testing, engaging our patients, um, going ahead and testing partners and the like for HIV, Hep C, providing the lock zone, doing HPV, so hepatitis B vaccination. But larger concerns tend to be state-focused policies that we can do. So how can we support needle exchange programs and having over-the-counter uh, programs with it? How can we provide free testing and initiation of heart for HIV positive individuals uh, rapidly, especially within rural communities and among substance using populations. Um, and some of this was really geared out to by uh, efforts within Indiana um, to address the Scott County outbreak, which we saw from then Governor Pence was allowing for a needle exchange that we put in place for a month or two at a time. And understanding that by putting a new prevention activity like a needle exchange for one month isn't going to call it an epidemic. Um, it, it creates its own problems. So when we start to look at these relationships then between 
HIV, Hep C, and substance use within these rural contexts, uh, we really can take a systemic type approach with that. And just to make sure that everybody's on the, the kind of same path of understanding syndemics. Um, this is to where we can start to assess how um, epidemics, uh, social and mental, how they intersect with each other and how they influence each other. Um, and that by having these uh, multiple epidemics at the same time, they're creating this kind of burdensome web where all things are intertwined with each other between health and social problems. And so, you know, a basic definition of syndemics is that these are two or more afflictions that are interacting synergistically that contribute to excess burden of disease. And my former students, they better remember that. <laughs> so. So we think about this traditional relationship between HIV and Hep C that we see there is burden within our communities here within Oklahoma. Uh, we understand how these two interact, that similar behaviors can uh, put an individual at risk for one or both conditions. Uh, we also see that among those living with HIV, um, a higher uh, incidence of HIV infection and the like. We then know that within this relationship, that we can enter, we add something like substance use um, into it, and that how substance use has been shown within the academic literature to impact HIV, but also hepatitis C within our communities. But at the same time, all three things are working together and they're interacting synergistically to create that dense web. Uh, so those who are living with HIV, who might be socially isolated, um, not able to secure employment, might turn to substance use as a coping mechanism, but of course we also have clients um, if they're not able to get housing or treatment, might engage in substance use to decrease inhibitions in order to engage in sex work and the like, in order to secure funds and meet basic needs. That there are these different relationships that are occurring for our patients that we have to be addressed that. The biggest thing, thing here is this idea that at its core, that diseases don't occur within the social vacuum. So all of these social effects are impacting health outcomes and driving the epidemics. And just as diseases don't occur within social vacuums, neither do we. I would like to believe that I live in a bubble, but we don't. And so these social forces, things like stigma, ostracism, lack of access, all of these things that we're interacting with impact our bodies and our behavior. And so transmission is no longer just a merely a biological process that there are these social factors. And so we can start to look at those social determinants of health, like isolation, trauma, stress, poverty, and the like. And traditionally, we start to look at how we can mitigate risk behavior. So how can I address these determinants to change your economy use partner, uh, patterns, to change uh, your needle sharing uh, patterns in order to address the epidemic? I would say we also need to, at the same time, look at the vulnerability of our communities. That we, we do a lot of work within those risk behaviors, but it has to occur within environments uh, that are conducive to those changes. Um, but at its core, if we don't address the social determinants, we keep to where people are vulnerable to these conditions. So we can mitigate uh, risk behavior at, at some point, but if we don't change what the community vulnerability looks like, we don't, we really can't address HIV. And so this then allows for uh, unique opportunities then uh, for intervention within these rural communities. And I think rural communities are important, uh, but we also have to look at the way we frame uh, public health in our initiatives. The overall, when it comes to HIV and sexuality related concerns, uh, we tend to be more reactive versus proactive. We react to situations. Um, if someone is has an STI or condition or has symptoms of it, we then have conversations about condom use and the like to protect themselves. Uh, we tend to lack about these proactive kind of measures to discuss testing um, and those types of spheres. We can then look at how we can engage popular opinion leaders, um, especially within rural communities, which could be uh, rural faith leaders to uh, ranchers um, to um, owners of large animal ag facilities uh, to how we have these conversations related to health in order to maximize their workforce 
um, but also really for the sustainability of rural communities. And these non-traditional participants uh, become essential uh, for not only as gateways into the community, uh, but also to ensure we have some sustainability uh, for the long term. And our, our biggest way to start to address some of these concerns, um, especially within rural communities related to policy, that a lot of our policy um, has a moralistic understanding of sexuality and sexual health. Um, and so we're trying to um, uh, essentially manipulate or control human behavior um, from a moralistic stance. And this comes down to even sexual health and education. Um, so we're here within Oklahoma, if we think about recent policy to modernize HIV education with the state um, by a great uh, partner, and in conjunction with the State Health Department. Um, and when it got to the governor's desk, it was ultimately vetoed. And so our education around HIV um, by statute remains decades kind of behind. We also, similar states to us, to where syringe exchange programs and syringe uh, service programs um, by statute um, cannot be uh, within our, our local communities to where you have underground type of de facto programs that are running. Uh, but it really can't be a constant source. So then community members don't know if they're gonna have access to the program or not. I think the biggest thing that we can do that for a lot of us that, especially on the academic side that are, that are paired with academic medicine is how do we train future physicians and current physicians um, related to HIV and sexual health. So one of the big initiatives that I've been working on with colleagues is about uh, responsive care for uh, sexual and gender minorities, how we create these affirming environments that if individuals are not willing to disclose their identity or their behavior uh, with their patients, we have missed opportunities then uh, for screening. Um, but also how we can start to normalize testing in general, that too often a patient has to present themselves and ask for a test. And this test is usually responsive to some type of incident um, to where they feel like they might have been at risk. Uh, but as a provider, we have this opportunity to change dialogues that if we're already, um, you know, I think of it for you know, basic uh, lipid panels or cholesterol, all these things that we're already drawing blood for, that we can have these dialogues about, as a provider, I wanna make sure our patients are aware of their status. And so once a year, we add on this. So where we normalize it to where you're not being individually singled out based on risk, uh, but if it's something that all patients do, we can just add on HIV test, Hep C, Pan, Hep C, or even RPR for syphilis, uh, catch individuals who might not traditionally feel at risk and then not present uh, for care or screening. Within our rural communities, I think we, we need to adopt telehealth and telemedicine. Uh, this is a way to enhance the care continuum against these known barriers to where you can link clients to um, affirming care um, communities. Uh, colleagues uh, have done a lot of work at about at-home testing and self-sampling. So how can we get testing within these communities that does not have to be uh, dictated by the care, either the uh, physician or little uh, local community clinic that they can go ahead and get access either through mail or picking up the self-sampling test and then send them back and then they get their uh, results either through uh, a virtual visit or the like. But how we can also use telemedicine within rural communities for PrEP diffusion. Um, we see within other areas that with this is, has worked well, especially with urban uh, spheres, uh, but given the need for increased providers that are willing to prescribe PrEP, how can we use um, centralized uh, locations to best serve all clients? So for example, how can we have uh, virtual visits available from community-based organizations that have either remote vans that are out within rural communities or that might have a physical structure within others uh, to where clients can present there to get screened uh, for PrEP, but then are really seeing a centralized provider that's serving all of these areas. And one of the big barriers uh, for that before uh, was for tenofovir or, or PrEP or Truvada uh, that we were worried about creatinine clearance. And now with new medications coming to market in um, the next couple of months, to SCOBY, we won't have that concern. So it'll be easier for us to get individuals in, see if they're a good candidate 
and then put prep on immediately. And so all of this falls in with current guidelines that we see within from the American Academy of HIV uh, Medicine, that especially among injection drug users, MSM and substance users, but really for anyone who want to increase screening and vaccination. Um, keep, uh, keeping track of people's window periods in that for those who are high risk, um, having them screened every three to six months. The adoption of PrEP, not only just for um, high risk men who have sex with men, uh, but for individuals who engage in injection drug use or have partners who engage in drug, uh, injection drug use, heterosexual individuals who do not engage in regular common use, but might not be in a monogamous relationship, or one of the partners also may at risk. So we are missing a large number of individuals who could be a good candidate for PrEP. Um, and part of this is just based on our screening and availability too. And PrEP becomes important because we know it's efficacious. Um, the research has shown, you know, 90% above um, efficacy there, and even among injection drug users, it's a 70% part of this is attributed to um, adherence, and then among people in drug use and drugs, we send it to see a low, lower adherence rates. And so, at least, especially from men who sex with men, or for sexual contact, uh, we have seen research looking at event-driven PrEP to where an individual could take, if they know on Saturday they're going to an event, a party, a raid, whatever, or that's likely a time where they tend to engage in sexual behavior, um, and they're not really great about adherence in general, taking a pill every day, that they could take a double dose of PrEP, two pills the day before, uh, a dose the day after, and then a dose after that. The efficacy drops within that, uh, but the larger argument here is that if we have clients that are knowingly engaging in uh, risk behaviors, we would want them to have some form of protection, even if it's only 70%, 80% versus 0%. And so I think it's reframing PrEP and how we look at PrEP in general, that ideally we want people to be taking PrEP um, every day but among our clientele, that this is just not an option. You know, is this a plan B if we're really trying to get to zero? And kind of finally within that, you know, I think if we're going to really address the epidemic within our state and what we can do, uh, we have to make forward movement on strange service programs. That this usually is the opportunity then for individuals to engage of uh, public health. So not only to get clean needles and works, but the opportunity to talk with social workers, case managers, um, other forms of allied hair, uh, health, um, get screened and the like, and find out what are some maybe of those determinants that are placing individuals at risk for wanting to use substances um, and then engage in treatment. So within all of this, we have all of these intersecting aspects I mean, this is just you know one way we can start to move forward, but in reality, it takes a due diligent public health uh, workforce that's robust that can engage these communities to start address this. And so, for that, we have to get to work. So, for anyone, especially on the Zoom side, if you have questions at any time, you can shoot me an email or via Twitter. Um, at the same time, I'm going to go ahead and. If there happens to be any question by the audience um, as well, I will go ahead and allow for that. If you have any question, you can just unmute yourself and you're welcome to pose or people in the room can as well. Go for it. So is somebody working with insurance companies to sort of institutionalize this idea of providing an annual screening. It seems like that would be kind of important to mm -hmm. get that paid for. Yeah, and I, I think there are some colleagues, and I think this is the role where uh, research comes into play, but also working with um, political leaders, but also health departments and the like, is that how can we create include HIV and STI testing and hep C testing as part of just general wellness checks. 
um, even from a, a worksite wellness perspective, how do we maybe offer these as part of other type of comprehensive things? I think we have to include some more data safeguards in that life. Um, but as a potential barrier could be costs. And so how do we minimize any costs that could be related to it? So I think that has to occur. But at the same time, we have to have physician education. So for example, I had a med student about a year ago who came to me and talked about he had just got out of a four-year monogamous relationship, was redating, wanted to um, get screened. And so he went to his primary care physician and said, I want to get tested for HIV, STI, all that. And the physician told him, no, you're, you're not at high risk. And so if someone who has that kind of high self-efficacy to present and have those conversations is having to challenge someone to kind of validate why they want to get screened. Um, I feel, you know, a lot of our clients that we work with that don't have the self-efficacy, if that happens one time, are they not going to ever ask again? Um, so I think it has to be a two-pronged approach that um, how can we work with insurance companies to address that while also doing education um, on the provider side. Other questions? Um, I'm thinking about information avoidance. Like even though you provide free screening service, but certain individuals are not willing to do it just because they fear or they don't know what to do next mm -hmm. if they are tested like positive. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's part of this care continuum is making sure that we're increasing screening that we have these linkage um, aspects set in stone. And I think our health departments have that, um, especially for providers who are regularly engaging in screening of creating additional education um, for primary, primary care physicians and the like that we could be also doing that. Uh, but I think you're right that traditionally with HIV and other STIs that they're, I like to call it, we have a mean girls approach to it, pretty bad movie reference, but uh, essentially that we teach people if you have sex, you'll get chlamydia and you will die. Um, or that there's this assumption that these conditions are only attributed to certain groups. Um, and so we stigmatize individuals who've had the, who have been infected, but also we stigmatize people who get screened. And so individuals don't want to be part or be um, almost be subjected to being aligned with those groups who are less likely to do it. And so I think the misinformation is part of that then normalizing it to where it's physician driven um, in kind of an opt out type of approach that we see that, you know, how many times when our doctor says, I'm gonna have some blood work, do we say, what are you gonna run? Or we look at the labs and look at everything that they're drawing. Um, so is that a way to catch people um, too, is to say essentially to normalize these processes. But I think we need increased health literacy um, about HIV and STIs. Uh, we've had some great campaigns within the state and the like to kind of decrease uh, that stigma, uh, but we also in the understanding what sex ed looks like and comprehensive sex ed looks like within our state, we need additional models, especially among marginalized communities uh, that might not be English speaking or if we think about migrant communities too, and that might be missed by some of our traditional public health often. Any other questions? Dr. Stoker. Yeah. So I've just recently met Dr. Johnson, mm -hmm. and he's working with the ECHO. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to me like something that might relate to this, although I don't know that much about it yet. But it's what engagement, community yeah. outreach, and a sometimes apply to mm -hmm. things like HIV? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we have a hepatitis C and HIV echo um, that are, are run by uh, Johnson and Matera and those folks there. Um, what we tend to see is individuals that are, that are individuals that are seeing patients that are living with HIV um, as well. I think as um, more responsive could be of what are things we should be doing for that on the forefront practitioner that could be screening as well, and how we could then have culturally congruent care. So, especially for the hepatitis C um, echo project, 
how do we create programs that are responsive to the need of native communities um, and creating toolkits that can be then used by providers. So from like HIV perspective, how do we do affirming care uh, for sexual and gender minorities that might be at risk? Um, but if you're not having an affirming experience with that provider, does it really matter what that provider says? We're not gonna really probably do it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think ECHO is a, a great way, uh, but also continuing education units and just ways that we can then engage these clientele too and working with their health departments at the same time. Any other questions? Well, thank you all for joining. I appreciate it and have a wonderful day.